Hello, everyone. Welcome to the OCLS Women in STEM panel discussion. I am Sarah. I'm an event planner for the Orange County Library System, but I also have a bachelor's in science and mechanical engineering and uh, worked as an engineer um, doing things like bottling adult beverages all the way to helping to power um, some of the biggest cities in the world. So I'm really excited for today's discussion. This project was made possible in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Thank you for joining us. Today's event is also brought to you by the NEA Big Read, which is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. This year, the Orange County Library System in partnership with Valencia College, celebrates Lab Girl by author Hope Jaron. Many virtual events will take place from March 28th to April 24th, 2021. Thank you for coming to the OCLS Women in STEM, STEM panel discussion. Tonight, we will be talking to four outstanding women who work in one or more of the STEM fields, which stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. Whether you are an aspiring biologist, programmer, engineer, teacher, or maybe just curious, we welcome you to our discussion. We will be taking audience questions, so feel free to drop those in a couple minutes once we get started. Um, and first, allow me to introduce our moderator this evening. Gabrielle Salazar has two degrees in bioengineering and Spanish and currently serves as executive director of Phi Sigma Rho, the foremost social sorority for women in engineering and engineering technology, which I am also a member of. Please join me in welcoming Gabrielle Salazar. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. I'll just let you take it away, Gabby. Awesome. So first let me uh, introduce our panelists for tonight. Uh, first, we have Brianna Parvis, who is a licensed professional environmental engineer with experience working in both the public and private sectors of water engineering. She holds bachelor's and master's of environmental engineering degrees from the University of Central Florida while working on a variety of potable storm and wastewater design projects during her nearly six years with Hazen and Sawyer. Brianna has specialized in computational hydraulic modeling of water distribution and sewer collection systems. Hi, Brianna. Hi. <laughs> Next, we have Kina Roberts. Kina Roberts graduated from Harvard College and holds dual master's degrees in, in international infectious disease epidemiology and development economics from Johns Hopkins. She's been working in the field of public health and healthcare consulting for more than 10 years, both domestically and abroad. Hi, Kina. Hi, thanks for having me. We also have Naomi Baptiste. Naomi is the 2020-2021 SWE Central Florida Executive Vice President. She holds a Bachelor of Civil Engineering from Florida State University, certific Certification in emerging, emerging Markets China Business, and a Master of International Global Business Leadership from the University of San Diego, where she was named the 2015 Woman of Impact. Hi, Naomi. Good evening, everyone. And lastly, we have Lorena Lucell. Lorena Lucell currently serves as a lead manufacturing engineer at L3 Harris Technologies in Palm Bay, Palm Bay Florida. In her current position, she leads a variety of programs in a space micro electronics lab for the Space and Airborne System Division. Lorena brings with her over 13 years of experience as a member of SHIP, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, having held various roles of increasing responsibility. Hi, Lorena. Hello, happy to be here. Well, with that, we'll get started. Um, I guess an open, open question for anyone who wants to answer first is, uh, if you wanna explain a little bit more about what you do, um, for your job and how it relates uh, to the STEM world. Uh, sure, I mean, I'll, I'll get started. So um, again, my name is Lorena and I work for L3 Harris Technologies here in Palm Bay, Florida. Um, and so the line of work that I do right now um, is in a microelectronics lab um, where we build a series of components um, that can go into space or into aircrafts. Um, the specific um, hardware that I am working right, with right now is um, satellites that we sell to NOAA and um, the National um, Geographic um, organization that oversees the weather patterns that are happening across 
um, the US and in the world, right? So um, more specifically, we build um, antennas and towers so that um, when a natural disaster is heading our way, um, they can quickly notify um, the news stations and individuals, um, homes, um, families, et cetera, companies, everybody, um, letting them know that something's coming our way. And so um, I build specifically four different satellites um, or antennas, I should say, um, that are going to be placed across the United States. So um, how does this relate to STEM? So we need um, this technology to give us a better understanding of the weather patterns that are happening um, and basically a good communication um, tool for us to be able to convey um, important messages and important information um, quickly. So um, my hardware specifically has an multitude of circuit cards assembled into it. Um, so anything from resistors, um, you know, capacitors, amplifiers, filters, um, things that, you, that individuals need to understand, like myself, um, how they function and how collectively this system um, will be able to communicate um, accordingly. So that's a little bit about what I do. Awesome. That was the one area of engineering that uh, lost me quite early. <laughs> yes. um, I can talk about uh, what I do next. So uh, I'm an environmental engineer, which covers kind of a broad range of, I, I like to call us pragmatic hippies. Uh, we mitigate the uh, environmental in impacts of industry and society. So uh, my company specifically deals with all things water. Uh, so that's going to be uh, dealing with conveying sewage, getting water to your houses, treating water, treating wastewater, stormwater mitigation, you know, that's going to be dams and, and reservoirs, that sort of thing. Uh, specifically, what I do is hydraulic modeling predominantly. I've done a lot of stuff since working with Hazen, but uh, that's my area of expertise. So uh, basically I create computer versions of piping networks. So the water that goes from the treatment plant to your door, I know how much pressure you get at your door. <laughs> and uh, my job is to help figure out where we can improve water quality, how we can improve hydraulic efficiency, that kind of thing. Wonderful. Kina, we'll go to you next. Sure. So I'm going to be um, sort of the, the odd one out here and not being sort of directly related to STEM as much as the other participants. But um, so my, my background is in public health and health systems. Um, and I've been working both in the U.S. and a lot in sub-Saharan Africa over the last 10 years. Um, and a lot of what I do is take the idea of, and this again is all pre-COVID, but the idea that a infectious disease outbreak could happen in a community. And in order to deal with that effectively, you not only need to understand the clinical background of how the disease is spread and who it impacts and what that looks like, but also uh, the sort of socioeconomic situation of the population you're dealing with, the economy, the politics, the environment, and all the other factors that might go into controlling an infectious disease outbreak and then building a long-term sustainable solution to prevent it from happening again. Um, so I've worked in um, Kenya and Ethiopia and South Africa and a lot of different places on sort of controlling an outbreak and building a system to keep it under control if it happens again. But more recently, I've been I live in New York State, which is um, an area that's been pretty hard hit by COVID. I mean, Florida is another good example. But a lot of the, what I've been doing in the last year or so is working with local health systems to say, you know, they say we have all this money, but we don't know how to spend it. Or we have existing programs that are funded through Medicaid or Medicare or a hospital outreach, but we don't know how to use that existing system to reach people and educate people and have them understand what's happening um, in a situation that has never really happened in the US before. It has for HIV, but that was again, transmitted through a specific community in a different way than COVID is. 
But having people who can help explain that and say, uh, here's what we need to do. Here's how we can do it. Here's how we can use the money available to create a system that's more sustainable over the long term. Um, that's sort of where I come in as a, as a consultant. Um, so actually today I've spent a lot of time doing vaccine education outreach to a lot of people who don't want to take the vaccine, explaining what it is, how it was created, the fact that it's safe and the fact that you need it. Um, but again, once that kind of uh, immediate impact is dealt with, then it'll be about building long term systems for tech and contact tracing and all that kind of stuff to control what happens when it happens again. Excellent. I was going to say, I, based on your bio, I assumed you had a pretty busy, pretty busy past year, or at least interesting from within. Chaotic, yeah. <laughs> and last, we'll hear from Naomi. So absolutely. I'm definitely a servant leader when it comes to increasing the number of women in engineering. We represent 12% of our demographic. That's why I'm so proud to work with the Society of Women Engineers in Central Florida. My nine to five, I also work in defense as well. We actually make secret aircrafts in which it's top secret. I can't go into details with it, but I make aircrafts in which that are non-detectable. You can see it in the air, but you definitely can't detect it by any electronic means. And so my work relates definitely to defense, but something that I'm very, very passionate about is the Society of Women Engineers. So it's my pleasure to be able to speak about that topic this evening. Excellent. Uh, speaking of us, we, the Society of Women Engineers, and also SHIP, as we had mentioned earlier, for you all, um, when you guys potentially were in college or even earlier, were there any organizations um, in addition to SHIP or SWE, or you can elaborate on those two, um, that you maybe had found especially useful being a woman in STEM, um, whether the organization helped you on an educational level or a mentoring level or uh, just general support? Was there an organization that you specifically found useful? Yeah, so I'll get started. Um, when I was an undergraduate, um, I attended a, a very pri small private university, Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. And actually, um, I was one of six that graduated um, in the mechanical engineering uh, department, and I was the only female. Um, and then in addition to that, I was one of the first Hispanics to graduate in their engineering department. So having said all of that, um, we didn't have a ship uh, chapter at my university. So um, we then geared towards um, starting and establishing a SWE chapter um, at TCU. And actually me and four other girls started the chapter because we wanted something more than the um, you know, they already established ASME or IEEE organizations that were there. So, um, so SWE helped me out tremendously, um, not only to find um, a good network and to find other women that um, looked like me and thought like me and um, did things like me, um, but that I also enjoyed engineering, but um, it helped me um, land those very important, crucial internships at the very beginning of my career. And um, it, it was actually, I started my my career with General Electric um, in Louisville, Kentucky. And so um, it was my, my professor that actually worked with one of the recruiters that was there. And she came up to, we went up to her and said, hey, Lorena is a really great student. Um, maybe you should you know, talk to her a little bit about what kind of positions you have available. And so here I am, you know, a sophomore, very shy, timid girl. All I really ever did was study um, and try not to get behind on my classes or tests or whatnot. So, um, you know, they gave me a, uh, they gave me a chance and I took that opportunity for two summers. I lived in Louisville and really, really experienced, really um, appreciated my experience with GE. So SWE helped me kind of get my foot in the door when it came to my career. And then after that, obviously, it's up to the individual to be able to shine um, and strive for success, right? So SWE helped me and then 
Um, when I became a professional, so after I graduated um, from TCU, I moved down to Austin, Texas, and worked for Motorola Semiconductor in the semiconductor division. And um, that's when I found out that there was a ship and that um, this um, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineering um, organization existed among the professionals. So I joined that very quickly and have been active since then. So that was since uh 2007 2008 um and through there you know i help out students um that were once in my spot um and kind of coach them mentor them guide them encourage them support them you know anything that um we can do to um you know promote stem and promote how amazing engineering is and how we are helping um, you know, communities and societies, um, you know, strive for a better tomorrow. Um, I think that that's really important, you know, be it in a college level or at a high school level, or even, you know, um, there were plenty of times that during for, for Engineering's Week in, in February, we had the opportunity to go back to the high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, and talk to them during their career days um, and share with them the, the beautiful things that STEM has to offer, you know. And so um, SWE gave me the opportunity to get my my career started. Um, and it also gave me the opportunity to see that, hey, I'm not doing it alone. Like maybe in my small you know, graduating class where I'm the only female, um, you know, that didn't matter because there was a large society of women out there that were striving for the same goals as, as, as I was. And so SWE is what I started with and, and SHIP is now what I'm mostly involved in. But um, here in the Central Florida um, chapter, whenever there's a volunteering event, I mean, I went, I, when I was, goodness, like two weeks away from giving birth to my firstborn, I was at the volunteering event. I was like, no, it's important for these children to understand um, the beauty of, of STEM jobs and, and STEM careers. So so that's how these the organizations have influenced um, my life so far. So as an undergrad at Florida State University, I could definitely say that there were three organizations that definitely catapult my career in engineering. Uh, Lorena did mention Society of Women Engineers. I also wanted to include the National Society of Black Engineers and also the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. I can say that these three minority engineering societies partner very well with one another. Um, I'm a financial member of all of these organizations as well, and I just love the fact that we're able to program together not only in professional development, but also in outreach, because we do events not only for professionals, uh, collegiate, and also K through 12, just to make sure that all those different pipelines have mentors and people who look like them so that we can continue to grow the pipeline. So it's something that I'm very proud of to have those three partnerships to work very closely with one another. Awesome. Yeah, I uh, when I was an undergraduate, I was a member of uh, SHIP. And then I also, obviously, I now work for Phi Rho, but I was also a sister of Phi Sigma Rho, um, which, as Sarah mentioned before, is uh, an engineering sorority um, or a, sorority, a social sorority for women in engineering and engineering tech. So it does a lot of the same um, outreach and support um, and networking that some of the other organizations do, but in a more traditional Greek setting. Uh, Kina, were there any organizations in the public health realm that were beneficial to you? Yeah, uh, no is the short answer. <laughs> um, in public health, in my experience, um, especially um, working abroad, a lot of the influence that I had that was positive and helped me along my career was really in the form of individual people and women who'd been in the field for a long time. Um, and the kind of, um, you mentioned earlier and you're saying my bio that I have two master's degrees, one's in epi and one's in international health econ. And the two fields are very, very different, um, which is kind of why I picked both so I could learn how to speak both languages. Uh, the international public health people are a lot more the humanitarian aid workers, the people who go in and kind of, um, you know, bring in food and water and do kind of uh, immediate aid relief. A lot of the international health people uh, or international econ people are sort of move in the more military defense area. 
Um, so working in both of them, um, you find kind of a, an area that's traditionally thought of as a little bit squishier um, that a lot of women traditionally gravitate to. And well, the other side of that is traditionally more male dominated and there are a lot more um, influence with the army um, and a lot more of that kind of, we go into a place and we control it with, with military force kind of way. So finding women who had been in this field for a long time and could talk about how you coming from a humanitarian side and, and a wish to kind of go somewhere and help people um, can work with some of those big um, military industrial complex sort of interventions um, was really beneficial to me. Also, uh, that I don't now obviously work in sub-Saharan Africa, but I have worked in a lot of places that are very dangerous and having women who've been working in those areas, um, both local people and aid workers from other countries who can kind of help you navigate that as a woman was incredibly beneficial to me. Um, it's just a short digression. I had a, a professor in grad school who I very, very, very much liked. And she had sort of this informal course she had for women um, coming out of the Hopkins grad program that she only ran after we graduated. We were no longer official students, but she would take us out to uh, this ranch that she had in Virginia and teach us the basics of defensive driving, how to de-arm a gun, and how come some of this other stuff that we would never know, but she thought we should know if we were going to go to you know, Western Ethiopia against the Sudan. And she thought that we should really have some of those tools so that we wouldn't be caught unaware. And having people like that sort of take the extra step to teach us things that weren't officially things we should know, but things that she personally thought we should know, um, just made us feel more protected and like we had more of an idea of what we were getting into before we got there. Wow, she sounds like an excellent resource to have as somebody uh you know, in your in your profession or in your inner circle to have teaching you all of the things that you both should know and maybe weren't taught. Um, so I'll go back. Brianna, do you have anything you want to add to this? Uh, as far as organizations went, uh, my extracurriculars were not very engineering focused. I tried to get involved with Engineers Without Borders, and I actually am involved with them now, but my college schedule never allowed for me to go to their meetings. So I was really involved with my uh, my college's like honors. There was like an, an honors congress is more or less what it was called, but it was a, a social sorority fraternity more or less for honors students. Um, as well as uh, Habitat for Humanity and those kinds of things. I And they gave me a lot of contacts in Central Florida when I still lived in Central Florida outside of just that central uh, uh, engineering circle. Excellent. Uh, I wanted to go back and touch on something that a couple of you had mentioned um, in the discussions. We were talking more so about undergraduate life or undergraduate collegiate life, but I wanted to kind of go back further in the timeline and ask you all who or what originally influenced you to pursue a career or education in STEM um, and or how we can promote STEM to the upcoming generations um, that we may have in our family, friends, or just anyone um, out there who who's a younger younger woman, younger girl who's wanting to explore STEM in the in her future. So for me, I credit definitely two people that sparked my interest in engineering. Uh, first, it was my uncle who was actually an electrical engineer for Coca Cola. Um, I fondly refer to him as Uncle Mathematics because when I was growing up, he would always quiz me on my math skills. Basically, he would say, what's 12 times 12? And I would immediately say 144. And then he would give me the M&M candy that I wanted for the day. But he basically made sure that my math skills were up, were up to par. And he always, always talked about how much fun he was having at Coca-Cola. So I knew that I wanted to be an engineer. And especially emphasizes the importance of having allies. So for me, being a female in engineering, my uncle was my ally, was the male representative there, but also encouraging me in engineering. Uh, the second person that was a true inspiration to me was Mae Jameson, who is the very first African-American female to go into space. Mae Jameson to me is everything. Not only is she an engineer, she's a medical doctor. She was an Avon Ailey dancer as well. So she did everything. 
So having her poster growing up made me feel as though I too can go in aerospace. I too can live out my dream and be successful. So this basically really emphasizes the importance of having uh, representation across the field, having strong female leads in engineering so that you can have or see yourself in these roles. So those are the two people who inspired me to pursue engineering. So I can speak a little bit to what got me interested in public health. Um, I grew up in, in sub-Saharan Africa. I lived in Botswana for 18 years when I was a kid and was there during uh, the kind of the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic in that part of the world and seeing what that disease did and is still doing to the, the people I knew and, the, and not only their lives and their families' lives, but also the infrastructure of the area and how the government was responding um, was really fascinating to me just because you could very much see that it was not only a disease and a population, but also the government and economy and the social response of people and what they thought um, the disease was and what it meant um, and how that differed in many ways to what doctors flying in were telling them about the disease in a way that, that was difficult to understand and difficult to incorporate into their, their existing systems. Now, so that's what was interesting to me about public health. It's not just the disease, it's everything else that surrounds the disease. And unless you take all of those elements into account, you can't fix the problem. Um, and in terms of getting younger people excited about it, I mean, I, it's hard to not to talk about COVID in this this way, but I what I think is is really exciting and, and what I've, it's hard to say enjoyed, but what I a part of what has been great to see about the way a lot of Americans have responded to COVID is that you can get younger people involved and you can talk to them about what's happening and how they as an individual, even as a small kid, can help this process. The importance of wearing masks and washing your hands, the importance about thinking about where you're going to go and who you're going to talk to and how all of that works and then getting the most vulnerable populations safety first and then moving on down the line and how all that works. And it's it's sort of a poor example, but um, my daughter's four and she understands how this is going and she understands about wearing a mask and she understands about germs. And all of these kid books have been coming out in the during the time of the pandemic and they're all doing a fantastic job of teaching kids stuff that they kind of knew but maybe didn't apply to their own lives. And it's really great that you can see kids now wearing masks and understanding how that works. And I think that if there is a small silver lining in what's been happening is that people get how that works now. They might be taking the time to take flu shots and wash their hands and think about what they're touching and who they're getting close to in a way they never used to before. So that growing awareness among young people about what's happening, where it came from and what they can do, I think is really exciting. Definitely. And I feel like we've also seen a spike in uh, people who are interested in, you know, getting graduate degrees in public health and things as a relate of the as a um, result of this as well. Yeah. And I think part of it is, as you mentioned, you know, there's so many other things that go into the the pandemic that aren't just, you know, focused on actually eliminating the pandemic. It's communication and, and you know, prevention and things like that. Um, and I think people are really seeing how that how they as an individual can can contribute and um, with their individual talents you know f affected in in those different ways i think brianna wanted to say something i was just gonna say um you know, as far as the the way i got into engineering is i come from like a lineage of engineers my grandfather was a structural engineer my uncles are uh are electrical engineers my brother is a computer engineer and uh, I also think my mom conned me into believing I was good at math and therefore I did well in math because I definitely excelled a lot easier, easier in the, the soft subjects, English, arts, those kinds of things. And every time I would say I was bad at, my, at math, my mom would tell me, no, you're not, you're good at math. And here I am. And I think it uh, has a lot to do with the fact that she wasn't necessarily within culturally uh, given the same opportunities to pursue math and science that her brothers were. Um, and so so that's how I, I stayed ahead on the, the math track and then I ended up in engineering. As far as interest in science goes, I can't even attribute it to a single person. Um, I always, I mean, I watched Discovery Channel as a kid before it was like all ice road truckers. <laughs> 
Um, but I did have a gifted teacher in elementary school who really opened up uh, the idea of learning for fun. Like she would just let us pick doing research papers on any topic. She didn't give us a topic. It was just pick something you like and go learn about it. And I loved that, you know, and I think that's really important to do with kids um, is to let them find the stuff they want to learn about so that they learn that learning isn't narrow and just what's assigned to you in a classroom. Lorena, your mic is off. There we go. Um, thank you. Um, I'll chime in as well. So um, unfortunately, no, I didn't have like family members um, that had been, um, you know, in these types of careers um, or received education. I'm, I'm first generation Mexican American. So um, my, my parents migrated to the United States um, in the early 80s. And so I was I, I was paving the way for, for my family. Um, however, um, I was grateful and blessed that both of my parents um, knew that I just, I had to go to school. I had to get good grades. Um, but when it came to like, you know, deciding what, what track or what field I was going to go into, um, I really owe it a lot to my high school. Um, I was um, in a magnet program or an accelerated program, which I think is similar to maybe charter schools now. Um, however, my magnet program was dedicated to um, engineers. So in the city of Fort Worth, um, when I was in high school, there was a school for like, if you wanted to study medicine, you went over there. If you wanted to study engineering, you went over here. If you wanted to study, um, you know, public uh, relations, you went over there. So. Um, so I went to the engineering one and um, I've always excelled in math and science um, since I was a little girl. I was the opposite of what some of you guys had said. Um, I did not do well in art or history or um, English, um, especially especially English because um, Spanish was my first language growing up. So um, the one thing that I, that I saw was in common in any language was math and science. And so that's why I gravitated um, towards that. So um, my, my um, high school, um, by the time I graduated, I had finished um, calculus one, two, and three. Um, physics one and two, and then I also took the extra mile and we went and did differential equations. So I finished all of that by the time I was in um, high school. And then when I was a freshman in college, I started um, with differential equations again as a freshman. And so um, I just noticed that, that I'm pretty good at these subjects, so I'm just going to keep going, you know? <laughs> so that's kind of how I ended up um, So in the STEM fields. The other thing that I want to attribute to was that um, I had applied to a summer program in, um, in Boston, Massachusetts, um, and it was called Math and Science for Minority Students, MS Squared. And I applied to that program, and basically, um, it was three summers of taking additional math and science classes. So my high school summers, instead of you know um, being at home or taking a summer job or being at pools or whatever kids do nowadays during the summer, um, I went out to Boston and I stayed at a, a local academy out there and um, felt like you know I was in dorms and got up early, went to the cafeteria, you know, went to my classes, studied. Um, and so um, it was beautiful to see that there were other minorities, um, African Americans, Native Americans, and Hispanics is what the program um, achieved to inspire the students to go into STEM fields. And so um, I, I definitely give credit to those programs for, for branching or for, for molding me into becoming who I am today. Um, because, you know, unfortunately, my parents and my family um, didn't know how to help. Um, they obviously did a wonderful job of providing a home and providing meals for, for me and my siblings. Um, but that's as far as they, they could take it. You know, um, I come from a very humble background, so I had to kind of figure this out on my own. And so what I do to inspire the next generation into um pursuing degrees in STEM is I go back to those schools. Um, I've had the pleasure of going back to my elementary, middle and high school and speak to the students and kind of just let them know, hey, you know, 
you are no, I am no different than you are. You know, we are of the same um, culture, of the same um, background. And I went to these classes just like you. And I sat in those desks just like you and ate at the cafeteria, you know, um, that, that you did. So if I can do it, you can too. And so I just have to be prepared and have a phenomenal presentation with all these like cool gadgets that they can see and do. Um, and I remember the years where I worked for Lockheed Martin and just showing them a miniature um, F-35 um, fighter jet was enough for them to get excited and showing them like, you know, what the jet can do and how it hovers and things like that was just like, wow, that's so cool. And I'm like, yes, it is cool, you know, and that's exactly what, um, what I think we need to do today is show them the fun parts that yes, it's going to be a lot of studying and it's going to be a hard um, degree to obtain, but it's so much rewarding um, when you get to this side and can contribute to to some of the the hardware and the items that that we're building. So, so yeah, it's a little bit more about me. <laughs> Excellent. Now I'll, uh, I'll take this time uh, for anyone who's watching on the live stream. If you have any questions that you'd like the panelists to answer, please. Um, drop them into the chat onto on the respective platform that you're watching from. Um, but to uh, follow up on that, I think uh, you're exactly right. You know, it's it's about making it seem these fields seem fun to these younger younger kids to grab their attention, um, and then also making sure that they know that they too um, can can do these things. Um, I wanted to ask what for each of you, what do you find the most fulfilling part of your job to be? The most fulfilling portion for my job is basically the, the people interaction. You know, I'm very proud of the machinery that we make. I'm very proud of the aircrafts that we make, the missiles that we make in defense. But overall, it's the people, the integrated product teams, whether you're working with the engineering team, supply chain team, program management, Overall, it's about building relationships and rapport with one another that we feel safe and that we trust one another to bring up any issues that what, that we might be experiencing so that we can resolve them prior to that showing up to the customer. And personally, within Society of Women Engineers, the best, greatest portion about my role there is building a pipeline of female engineers. Because I'm telling you, we might be 12% within the engineering demographic, but the 12% that are very active and in our community, we're very passionate about the things that we do about creating this pipeline for our collegiate and our K through 12, just to let them know that, hey, if I can do it, you can too. So what I'm very passionate about is mentoring and creating that pipeline of more female engineers so that they can excel, so that I can retire and that they continue the pipeline. Yeah, and that pipeline, it's really amazing how much of a difference, you know, one person can make. Uh, I do, like I said before, I do modeling. I learned everything I know from another woman who actually lives in Raleigh um, and has, and so we've never been in the same office except for maybe two times for a couple days. Um, but she has about, I think, eight modelers who all work like under her that she mentors and we're all women. And we don't know if it's just that all the women in the company gravitated towards this type of engineering or, you know, if we all just kind of like Crystal a lot, but, but because of her, we all, we have like kind of a small community, even though all of us work across the country um, as being all these female modelers who all work for Crystal. So just that one person can really make a difference for the next, the next group coming down the line. Um, as far as what's fulfilling in my job, uh, personally fulfilling is I love problem solving and that's why I like hydraulic modeling. Uh, the other aspect of, of what I could be doing as an engineer is more design engineering, which is, uh, is a little bit more of like practical problem solving of like, okay, well we have this much space and we need to put in something this big and let's do that. But hydraulic modeling is a lot more uh, kind of a pure problem solving. It's a lot more math. It's a lot more hydraulic, uh, you know, fluid dynamics. Uh, but I think the more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, altruistic fulfilling part of my job is that water is essential to people. So it's really great to be 
part of uh, a part of our infrastructure that people don't think about very often. They just turn on the tap and expect water to be there. Uh, and I know everything that goes into turning on that tap and water being there, which is is kind of exciting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in public health, in, in terms of the actual work that I do, the most exciting thing is when you design an intervention or create a system of recommendations and then see them put into place and see them work. Um, that's often really difficult to do because if you're coming from the sort of epi disease clinical side and you're talking to government, um, there's a lot of barriers there in terms of, you know, what they can do in their own constituents and money and things that they don't maybe want to do and trying to present a plan in a way that makes sense, not only in the sense that it will solve the problem or at least diminish the impact of it, but also as something that you can sell to a government or an individual politician in a way that they will support it and make it happen. Um, that's difficult to do. And when that happens, it's great. Um, and I think that in sort of a general, more cosmic public health level, uh, I think a lot of people, as speaking specifically in the U.S., until recently have kind of ignored public health as a field. Um, there haven't been a lot of outbreaks. There's been local stuff like in our New York, measles has been a thing and vaccine resistance is, is a thing, but there aren't a lot of mumps outbreaks or rubella or a lot of kind of spreading diseases that aren't the flu. And so I think that it's become recent with things like Ebola and SARS that people have really started to pay attention to the fact that um, what's happening in China or the or Europe isn't something that is a very real threat to Missouri. And that's something people haven't really thought about. So even if it's just in media or in the, the game you can play on your phone, play gank or the pandemic board game, like people are beginning to sort of remember that these are things that can happen and think about diseases and the spread of disease in, in a new way. And then it makes it kind of reminds people that this is this is more than just take your flu shot and wash your hands, which my dad used to joke that I got a master's degree and wash your hands, which is true and you should. <laughs> but there are some now more current reminders that this is something that is is really cool and interesting and um, and something that, that people spend their whole lives to thinking about in terms, and you know, it's not, again, it's, it, I hope you take me with my word. It's not great when there's an epidemic or an outbreak of something. But when you get to see the people in the white suits coming in to fix it, there's a bit of awesomeness there that you can turn into a way to make this seem cool and interesting. Ebola is objectively terrifying. But there are objective people out there who can jump in from the CDC and the WHO and fix that. And that has nothing to do with politics. In my mind, it has nothing to do with who you are, where you're coming from. You are the hero doctors who can jump in and fix it and the disease trackers who can figure out what's happening and how to stop it. And that is cool. And the more people you can talk to about making that cool, then the more people are educated about public health and the better it all gets. And that's also very exciting. Yeah, so for me, um, I, um, there's a couple of things that excite me about my job, but I'll take it a step higher. You know, my degrees are in mechanical engineering um, in, in, as an undergraduate and my master's is in manufacturing engineering. And I've been able to do quite a lot with those two um, degrees. Um, and so, you know, I, I worked with um, refrigerators and dishwashers with GE. I worked with um, semiconductors um, for Motorola. I worked for uh, Med Medtronic where we were building um, medical surgical tools, um, you know, to the F-35, a fighter jet for the government. And now I'm working on antennas and satellites. And so um, all of those jobs have moved me um, from Kentucky to Texas to California and now to Florida. And um, I, I, I want to say that that's probably one of the most exciting things about my job is that um, my role in all of these companies and for all of these products were um, manufacturing. So building, how do we build this? How do we write instructions? How do we teach our technicians? How do we um, make sure we have the right supplies and the right uh, material available to everybody that needs it when they're building it. And, you know, I think that um, I've been able to do it for a variety of products and I'm excited for, you know, maybe I've always dreamt to work for Nike in their manufacturing line and, and build, 
you know, athletic shoes. So maybe one day that is what I'll be able to do. And so um, I enjoy my job because I'm always um, able and wanting to learn something new. And um, my degree offers me the ability to do just that. Yeah, I think a lot of engineers are like that. They like that, you know, there's always something to learn and that continual pursuit of, of you know, the next unknown or the next thing to tackle. Um, I'll go back to something that you touched on earlier, but I think, you know, you had mentioned being um, the only wom woman in your undergr undergraduate program and um, one of only a handful of um, Hispanic engineers. Would you say, what would you say um, either as a Hispanic or as a woman um, in STEM have been some of the biggest things that you've had to, biggest obstacles you've had to overcome? Oh, goodness. Um, there's a lot. <laughs> um, but I'll start off with one of the things that just, you know, kind of, kind of comes off of the top of my mind is that um, in my culture, um, it was expected for me to get married rather young and have children. And um, maybe, you know, it's expected for, for women to do that in general. Um, but, you know, it was upsetting to some of my extended members, um, especially, you know, my, my uncles um, back in Mexico, um, that I decided to go to, to get an education, to, to go to college. And so to them, it's like, fine, you're going to go to college, but you have to be a nurse or you have to be a secretary or you have to be a teacher. And I'm just like, no, I don't, I don't have to do any of those things if that's not what I want to do, you know? And um, at that time I knew I liked math and science. So I was going to give engineering a try, you know? And so, um, you know, th that was a, a moment of like, you know, I could um, give up and, and say, yeah, my uncle's right. I can't, I can't do this, you know, or later on in life, once I graduated from college and started working um, full time, my, the same individual said, um, yeah, well, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna last there very long because it's hard and it's a lot of men around you and they don't want to work with women and, you know, yada, yada. And I'm just like, okay, well, I'm going to stick it through and I'm going to see if I like it. And so here I am 13 years later and I'm still, you know, in this field um, and I enjoy it thoroughly. And, you know, now I have conversations with that uncle and he's like, I'm so sorry that I said those things to you. And it was very immature of me. And I am so proud of you. And I'm, you know, you're you're one of my favorite nieces. And I appreciate the things that you do. And, you know, like um, I'm your biggest cheerleader, you know. And so it's it started off with within my family, within my culture, um, you know, and and not letting that um bother you and, and it actually did the opposite it, it fueled my fire it, it kind of made me think like well you know what i'm going to do all of this just for my uncle just so that he can see that i can and will do this you know so that's a on a personal level what happens um at work it's it's always discouraging um not to see very many women and then not to see very many minorities um, but when I do um, see those in com coming into the company, recent graduates or even interns, um, that's my opportunity to mentor. And that is the opportunity to engage with them and let them know we are so happy you're here. Please don't go. Please don't leave me alone. <laughs> but just to get them excited and to get them to see that. Um, you know, that we can, we can be a community and we can work together and we should work together. Um, and that, you know, overall, we're just very happy to have them there. So, um, you know, we're, we're never really um, truly alone, but it's, it's just that much more exciting when we get to see um, other individuals like ourselves um, in those meetings next to those rooms full of, you know, um, men. So, yeah. So for me, one of the biggest challenges that I can speak to, and perhaps this might be more related towards um, race diversity, but there's this saying that goes, you have to be twice as good just to be considered average. And what that basically means is that you'll find that um, a lot of race minorities will have PhD, multiple masters, multiple certifications, just to prove that, hey, 
we, we deserve to be in this field um, or in this area of the business. And so that's why I stress, especially to a lot of my mentees, I tell them, of course, I will be your mentor, but this is why it's so important to have male allies and encourage more mentoring programs to build relationships. Because essentially, you know, we all bleed red at the end of the day, and we all need to be building relationships just to make sure that that we have this pipeline of more female engineers. So I see that that's one of the biggest challenges, but I think that we can overcome them with mentoring programs, sponsoring diverse candidates, and just making sure that essentially we're building relationships with the people in our office. I'll ask you a follow-up question, because I think uh, oftentimes there aren't many men who um, are like Lorena's uncle who kind of come around to their misunderstandings about the potential of women. But in your opinion, what's one way that you can work on men who are maybe coworkers or family members or whoever and, and help them become allies in your pursuit of equality? So for me, here's a little secret. This is something that I do. So I actually have a board of directors, um, various mentors, but none of these people actually know that they're my mentor. I just keep scheduling meetings on their calendar every two months and asking them technical questions, getting their buy-in, getting their feedback, and just um, asking questions. So through this methodology, I'm building relationships. They're looking, they're looking at me for um, opportunities in the business, but I never gave the, I never knighted them as you are my official mentor. So that's what I do. Just build relationships. And if you see somebody who's very technically savvy and you want to learn what they know, put some time on their calendar. But I always tell people, have introduction meetings, build a rapport first, make sure that you respect that person, that that person has credibility, and just every two months, put something on their calendar. I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of reoccurring meetings because if you don't find value in that relationship, you don't have to keep, uh, keep forcing it. But if that's a relationship that you value, put something on their calendar. Um, something I've found over the years, and I think it's a result of engineering curriculums being so crammed full of classes that there's not a lot of room for some soft subjects that kind of open up people's worldviews. So I find a lot of my male peers just have no clue about the experiences, the lived experiences of people who aren't white men around them. And so they, they're not even like, they're not trying to be, uh, uh, malicious in any way, they're just oblivious. And so I think that the biggest thing is just like leaning on friendships with your coworkers and then just vent sometimes to the things that happen to you. You'd be shocked at the things they don't pick up, get picked up on. Like I get hugged all the time by people, not my coworkers, but colleagues outside of my office. Everyone else gets a handshake and I get a hug and I hate it. It's the worst. But no one noticed it until I complained about it, like, you know, lightheartedly, whatever, not in front of the person who hugged me. And then all of a sudden they start noticing. And then it's like, oh, you do get hugged instead of handshake. And it's, it's that it's slow work. But I think it's important to just disseminate what happens to us, our experiences to people who otherwise aren't going to see it. Yeah, and I think um, I've done a lot of work with with people who work in pharma, a lot of older white men who have a lot of money and a lot of clout in their organizations. And often, especially in the last company I was in, um, the last company I was in was, was a great place in a lot of ways, but they tended to shuttle young, good looking women into sales. And I was in research and consulting. And so often I would end up, um, since I was the senior person who was working in pharma and health, leading meetings or going to attend meetings and bringing on some of the, the younger women who worked in sales. And you could walk into a meeting with five people who worked in pharma who are our clients. So they automatically had the upper hand and they would just steamroll my colleagues and in often very sexist and inappropriate ways. And um, they would just walk out feeling utterly demoralized, completely demeaned and I bring male colleagues in our team, not do anything about it. And this happened once and I thought, you know, this is one of those moments where if I don't do it, 
I'm senior enough that I'm not worried about losing my job. So if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. So I just started doing it. <laughs> and I started saying, stopping the meetings with clients and saying, you're not going to talk to my colleague that way. Can we back up and let me take over and blah, blah, blah. And I think that um, it was terrifying and I was sweating. And I, I, I think in, at the moment you kind of have that blank screen across your face and you kind of don't know what's happening anymore. But the soon as it happened and, you know, we had a meeting with senior people back at our office and said, we are not going back to that client. You're not sending this 22 year old girl who doesn't know anything about sales into an environment like this again. And if you are, then I'm going with her every single time. If you're sending her out for a client meeting, I will go with her every single time. She has a dinner meeting, I will be at that dinner meeting. And I am sure that I gained some bit of a reputation for that, but I also got a whole crew of younger people who wanted to work with me and learn how to talk up, speak up for themselves against these people that were treating them terribly. And I think that having male colleagues see what we were doing and kind of jump in, and if I couldn't make it to a meeting, then they would. And I think that walking the walk in that sense is really key to sort of show an example for younger people. And I'm very proud of being able to do that. It was horrible <laughs> to have to do at the time, but I will never go back to just sitting idly by and watching someone be talked to in a rude way and think that that's just how a client relationship should, should be. And um, our male colleagues either defending me or saying, Yes, when I started speaking up or, or is hugely important to that. But I think that modeling that and then expecting it um, is, is really important to do. Yeah, so I guess the last couple of things that I'll mention is that we have to remember that all of these individuals have some sort of female figure in their life, you know, be a mother, a daughter, um, a wife, um, an aunt, a grandmother. So um, one way or another, they, like Brianna had said, you know, they may not even realize that they're they're behaving this way or they're acting this way, but um, they mean no harm, you know. And so um, sometimes I feel like some of my coworkers that are older gentlemen, they're like, oh, you know, you think just like my daughter or my niece would have said that, you know. And so that's kind of like your moment for you to. Um, come in and get to know them a little bit better, you know, and, and find something that's relatable to them, you know, such as, you know, earlier this week, um, one of my technicians was like, hey, my, my son has a fever, I have to go home. And I'm like, okay, no worries. And the next day, you they come back to work and you say, how is your son feeling? You know, I hope they're doing a little bit better today, you know. Um, those types of things to just get to know them a little bit um, better and, and get to be at the same level, like personally, you know, I'll, I'll give you another example. Uh, when I was at GE at an intern, I was given a task with a group of men that didn't want to work with me at all, didn't want to share with me information, didn't want to uh, work together. You know, they just were like, I don't know who she is, but I don't like her and we're just not going to work. And so it took me a while to kind of get them to break down that wall with me. And how did I do that? I brought donuts and breakfast tacos for a really long time. And, um, you know, maybe that wasn't the right way to do it as an intern because I didn't have much money to begin with. But, hey, it got the project done and um, I'm happy for the results at the time. And so you just kind of have to find a way for them to to trust you and to confide in you and to know that, you know, I'm not an enemy. I'm, I'm here to work together. You know, I'm here because we have a task at, at hand. Let's, let's do it together. And so we just have to, for me, what worked has been finding a way for them to be able to, to relate with me as well. Great points. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, so I kind of want to end this on more of a, um, uplifting note, shall we say, but uh, maybe you guys can elaborate on what your goals and hopes are um, for future generations of women in STEM and, and what, in your eyes, it would look like to be, you know, to achieve equality, um, have equal representation, um, and really just have the same success that men have had in the field um, in the past decades, uh, if not centuries. What would that look like for you? My hope is that in the future, women don't have to think about being representatives of anything. I don't want to have to think, 
well, I'm good at math, so I guess I need to be an engineer as opposed to I want to be an engineer. I need to be the best at this because otherwise I'll be a woman who's a bad engineer. I don't want that. I don't want who you are to have to determine what to do with your life. And that's that's mine. <laughs> So I believe it's in, it has to do with diversity, right? Um, you know, different ages, um, females, males, um, different minority groups, different religions, different everything. Just the way of thinking has to be different. And that diversity has to be at an executive level. Um, they have to be the CEOs. They have to be the VPs. They have to be directors. Um, and that's when change will really come. So, you know, for me, um, my hope personally is that one day I do get to become one of those executive levels and um, start taking a closer look at simple things like equal pay for, for women um, and in general for, for people that are that are doing the exact same job should get paid the exact same amount, you know, or vouching for those individuals that um, deserve those raises or those promotions, you know, too often um, do we see, you know, oh, well, that's my buddy, so I gave him more money, or, you know, I hired um, my cousin or my niece or my nephew, whoever, and so therefore they should be a manager. It's like, no, like, let me get to that position and start changing things around, because nobody helped me, and, and nobody should help anybody. It's a matter of showing that you're capable and want to do that thing, those things and, and are shining in your own way. And so um, what the change that I want to see is when I get to those um, to that position one day is to look back in a moment like today and, 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 and reflect on how I felt and things that needed to change and be the change um, that that younger generations need. So so that's kind of how how I see it. Yeah, Lorena really hit it in terms of leadership. And if you don't have a diverse senior leadership, then you're not heading in the right direction. Um, but in terms of, I mean, thinking about public health and intervention is only going to work if people trust you. Um, you can say all you want about how diseases spread and how governments should change their policies and how people should behave. But um, as you all know better than anybody, um, people are not just going to change their behavior because some person told them to. It has to come from a belief in the system and the input of trusted community leaders who are telling them from a position of trust and familiarity that this is how things should, should go and here's why. And here's why you should believe me when I tell you that. And moving that away from um, a traditional kind of ivory tower approach to here's a policy, do it, into more of a grassroots thing that everyone can participate in and understand and buy into and believe in, that's really how things are going to work. And that will involve people from all walks of life, all communities, especially the underserved, and all kinds of backgrounds to buy into a system that works across groups. So that's what it would really look like to me. So just recently on the news for a Fortune 500 car manufacturer, I just saw that they have a 51% board of directors that are all female. And so that reminded me of a quote by Supreme Court Justice Ruth Gainsburg. May she rest in peace. Uh, the quote goes, when I'm, when I'm sometimes asked, will there ever be enough women on the Supreme Court, I say, when there will be nine. And people are shocked when I say that. But there are nine now and nobody raises an eye. So I know that we'll be making a path forward when people aren't shocked that we have an all-female board of directors, when it's not making news because it's the norm. So thank you for having us this evening. Thank you. That was very well said. Um, thank you all for uh, serving as our panelists tonight. Uh, you guys all had some very um, thought provoking and, and inspirational stories and experiences that you shared with us. And I um, wanna thank you for taking the time to do so. Um, and thank you to everyone who is watching on one of the live streams. I hope you all enjoyed this as much as we did. Um, and just thank you for, for attending and thank you for the Orange County Library System for putting this event on.
Yes, thank you. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to be the first to find out when we have new fun and informative videos for you. Orange County Library System is your place to learn, grow, connect.